one of the things we learn in the study of the Gospels is that a good bit of it is about the training of the Twelve. Uh, and you know, how Jesus uh, gave them preliminary training so that we can dip into that same bucket, you know, later on. So that's kind of what we're doing. We're just giving a few highlights of Jesus' training of the Twelve, uh, and beyond the Twelve even. Uh, you know, there were interactions that he had with other people as well that teach us things about ministry. And so uh, do encourage those of you who were not here last week to either go online or to pick up the CD and get the, the teaching from last week too. All of it is coming from the middle portion of, of Luke, the Gospel of, account of Luke, so that you can kind of follow along. And it is not necessarily important that it's chronological, but in Luke it's chronological, so uh, as time goes on. So uh, tonight we continue with these basic lessons that Jesus taught his disciples in the book of Luke. Uh, and the first lesson that we're going to be looking at is prioritizing the good part. Now some of these, of course, you've heard from me before, some of these lessons. Uh, we're going to just highlight them tonight, but uh, the, I've given it a, a secondary title of how to avoid burnout. One of the things that happens in ministry, whether you are a full-time pastor like myself, Pastor Bill, or, or if you are a volunteer, or whatever you're doing in service to the Lord, if you're a giving person, a person who's helping others a lot, uh, you know, there are times when you just kind of feel like you run out of gas. Uh, you just don't know, you know, you don't feel like doing it. You, you, you know, you just, that's a signal that, uh, that we need to uh, take some time and be with the Lord uh, and just draw from Him and be refreshed in Him. Uh, because you're not any good in ministry much if you're burned out. <laughs> you know, you, you uh, are uh, not as effective at that point. And it's not the, you know, the, the, the energy that's expended, uh, or even the time expended, it's not what burns people out. Uh, we're going to take a look at that tonight. What is it that burns people out then in ministry? Uh, and so, I think there's a vignette here uh, that involving... Uh, Mary and Martha that gives us an idea of what it is that causes uh, burnout the most. Uh, so uh, let's take a look at Luke chapter 10, verse 38. Now it happened as they went that he entered a certain village, and a certain woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, who also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word, but Martha was distracted with much serving. And she approached Jesus and said, or approached him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Therefore, tell her to help me. And Jesus answered and said to her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and troubled about many things. One thing is needed. One thing is needed. In other words, what he's saying here, just one thing is what is absolutely essential above everything else. And Mary has chosen that good part, that one thing. Uh, and so this is a foundational issue that causes us to be effective in ministry and not be burned out in ministry. Uh, and uh, so he says, this will not be taken away from her. Now, this is a story in contrast between Mary, uh, Martha, who was worried and troubled about many things, and Martha, uh, Mary, her sister, who sat at the feet of Jesus learning from him. Now, Jesus said that Martha has uh, become worried and troubled. You know, we don't get worried and troubled just in a flash, do we? It's usually from taking, uh, you know, letting things come into our hearts and minds that trouble us and we get to generate a lot of anxiety. And, and you know, you can get really tired worrying about things, right? Uh, that's the thing that exhausts people more than anything else, more than physical you know, exertion more than the time spent in doing something. It's worry over what's going on in our lives or in, in ministry, too. And so those things keep us up at night. You know, we wake up in the middle of the night thinking about those things. Uh, I know in ministry I do that sometimes, you know, there'll be something going on. And, and now I'll wake up in the middle of the night and start thinking about it. Oh, well, you know. And you know, the only answer to that that I have found that's effective is exactly what Jesus is talking about. That one thing. 
You know, when I, when I am troubled about many things, uh, when I wake up in the middle of the night like that, there's one thing that helps me, only one thing. And uh, that is the good part that Jesus mentions here, uh, which is being at rest in his presence, listening to him, asking him questions, trying to understand, you know, what his point of view of things is. Because, you know, one of the things I discover is that my point of view gets kind of skewed. And anxiety is, you know, skews our perspective on things. Uh, and uh, so we have to uh, stop, hit the pause button, and say, Lord, I'm going to take some time just to rest in you, sit at your feet, listen to you, what you're having to say. Uh, and then he will help us get uh, things into perspective. So that's what we learn uh, from it, implicitly from Mary, is that ministry is most fruitful when it begins from a position of resting in the Lord, uh, first of all, and learning from him. What we implicitly learn from Martha is that ministry that begins in our own efforts and our own perspective will lead to anxiety and burnout. Uh, and so, uh, you know, Martha was in need of hitting that pause button we talked about. Uh, she, she clearly shows symptoms of anxiety and burnout. And uh, some of those are, for instance, uh, uh, anxiety, uh, where, which colors everything dark and gloomy. You know, she had a gloomy, I, I picture her as having a gloomy look on her face. You know, glancing, these darting glances over toward Mary, you know. Why isn't Mary helping me? You, know, you ever do that? You ever, you ever think that way about fellow brothers and sisters in the Lord? <laughs> why aren't they helping, you know? Why aren't they doing this? And, uh, you know, uh, why doesn't anybody see what needs to be done around here or whatever, you know? And, uh, and you get worked up that way. And so that's kind of what was happening with Martha here. Um, and so she was overcome with worry. Even the mundane and simple things become complicated and difficult. So anxiety, you know, it magnifies things. You know, whatever, a lot of times what I'm anxious about is not as big a deal as it seems to be in my own mind, you know. Uh, and so when I sit before the Lord and ask him about it, and he, sometimes I just almost feel like the Lord is saying to me, be at peace, Jerry. <laughs> Just relax, you know. <laughs> this is going to work out. Uh, and it does. Uh, but, you know, I get the feeling like I need to be in control of this and make sure it happens the right way, you know, and, and all of these kinds of things. You know, I don't think I'm a control freak. <laughs> but uh, I do have a need sometimes to feel like things are in control. Uh, <laughs> Corey Ten Boom says that worry does not empty tomorrow of its sorrow, it empties today of its strength. So worry is what leads to, to weariness. Uh, worry, uh, anxiety, causes us to feel exhausted at times. Mental exhaustion, to me, is worse than physical exhaustion. Uh, far worse than that. Uh, so stress, those kinds of things. Another symptom of anxiety out of control here is frustration with people around us. Uh, Mary really is not to blame for Martha's, you know, her, her troubles. Uh, but she's, she's kind of pointing the finger at her sister as to why she feels the way she does. And it's coming from within her own soul. And another symptom of Martha's anxiety is that she has an insatiable need to control her environment, you know, around her. Even, uh, even control Jesus, you know, uh, what Jesus is doing or not doing. Uh, and, uh, so, uh, anyways, that's, uh, that's what we're kind of seeing here, I think. She was clearly in a hard case of burnout. Uh, and you know that you're feeling these things, this kind of thing, when your, your enthusiasm is kind of on the wane. And you're no longer excited the way you used to be about serving and ministry and, and reaching out to people and helping with things. And, uh, and uh, your idealism is taking a battering, you know. Uh, and... So, you know, in talking to people who are going into the ministry as a pastor and that kind of thing, I always try to do a little bit of reality therapy with them, you know. And uh, this is not a dream state here <laughs> with your pastor. You know, it's not an ivory tower we live in here. You know, you're dealing with real people, real problems, real issues. Uh, there's administration stuff that should be, you're going to just say, I just hate this kind of stuff. And then, you know, all those kinds of things. And you're going to be, you know, saying, ah, you know, this is not what I thought it, it was going to be. You know? uh, and uh, 
Uh, now, I didn't have too much of that when I decided to be a pastor because my dad was a pastor. And I grew up around all that stuff. So, uh, you know, I didn't have any illusions about much of anything. And, um, but, you know, the serving in the body. Uh, sometimes it's a thankless job. Sometimes nobody's saying, oh, thank you so much for helping around here, you know. <laughs> and, uh, you know, just, uh, uh, you know, you, you do it unto the Lord. Whether you're getting thanks for it or a word of appreciation or reward from other people or not. We're not, we're doing this as an act of worship from God, whatever we're doing. And so, if we keep that in mind, it will help us with those kinds of feelings. Uh, so, we're reminded that fruitful ministry begins from a position of rest rather than one of serving. Uh, now, it doesn't mean you don't serve, you don't rest forever. <laughs> you know, there comes a time when you're rested and you get up and begin to serve again. Uh, and you don't just continue to isolate or to <coughs> lay back from serving. But when you get replenished, uh, refreshed in the Lord, uh, I know. The Apostle Paul talked about how different brothers would come and visit him, and he said they were they, they were refreshing to me, you know. And uh, we don't none of us are called to carry the load alone, you know, in anything that we're doing. So uh, uh, Jesus said right before he entered their home, we know this from the Gospel according to Matthew, "Come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am." Group gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Uh, and, and that's the key thing, to understand that we're yoked with the Lord, that He is carrying the, the biggest load. And, and we don't have to carry His load. Okay? We don't have to be uh, get this Messiah complex, you know, where it's all up to us. And uh, if I don't do it, nobody will kind of thing. Uh, we don't carry the, the we, we're not in Jesus' yoke. We're in the yoke he's made for us. Uh, and his yoke is not abrasive. It, it is not uh, hurtful to us. Uh, and uh, we get tired when we try to take on the yoke that is not designed for us. Uh, and that happens sometimes, too, where we, where we are doing <laughs> a, serving in a way that doesn't fit in the body of Christ. You know, we're doing something that just really doesn't fit who we are. We're not, we're not gifted in that way. And so uh, it becomes tiresome to us or exhausting to us because of that. Uh, so I think Martha here was trying to wear the lead yoke is what she was doing. You know, she's telling, uh, she's telling, uh, uh, she's probably been telling Mary what she wanted her to do. Now she's telling Jesus what to do. <laughs> so relax, Martha. Take, take time for the one thing, that good thing, that good part. Yeah. Uh, now, last week, we kind of ran out of time. I got in a real hurry at the end, and I didn't mean to sound like I was saying we can't have any interaction. So if you want to share something or ask a question, you be sure to do that, okay? Uh, if I have to talk faster on one of these things, I'll talk faster. Because <laughs> yeah. we want to hear from you if, we need to, uh, if you need to share something with us. So. The second lesson that we're going to look at is praying like Jesus prayed, or accessing the spiritual realm. Uh, the disciples watched Jesus pray, uh, and the disciples likely only knew about prayer based upon the Jewish prayer books that they would read prayers out of in the synagogue, and perhaps in their own homes as well. The Jewish prayer books were actually published about the time of the Second Temple. Uh, and so they became pretty prominent in the Jewish, uh, you know, learning prayers. So they would recite prayers. You even see that today with, with, uh, uh, with, your, with Orthodox Jews on a plane flight or something. I, one time I was flying to Israel, we stopped off in London, and there were a bunch of Orthodox Jews there. And, or, uh, and they, were, they were rocking back and forth reciting prayers, you know. And, uh, different things from uh, what they had learned and, and to do. And, and so uh, you, uh, uh, so that's what the disciples understood prayer to be. But they watched Jesus pray, and his was different. He didn't use a book, <laughs> you know? Uh, he just talked to the Heavenly Father. 
Uh, and uh, they also had noted that John taught his disciples to pray. Uh, and they were hungry to know about prayer. Uh, and so uh, they, uh, they wanted to, Jesus to teach them how to pray. Uh, he seemed to be, when he prayed, he seemed to be refreshed. Kind of like we were talking about with, with Mary sitting at the feet of Jesus. He was refreshed from being in the presence of the Father in the same way. Uh, he would be tired uh, at the end of the day, and he would retreat sometimes. And what would he do? He would go and he would spend time with the Heavenly Father. And he would be refreshed and replenished. And it was there that the Father gave him directions uh, for what was coming up next. So let's look at uh, Luke chapter 11, uh, verse 1. Now it came to pass, as he was praying in a certain place, that when he ceased, one of the disciples came to say to him, said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John also taught his disciples. So Jesus already was teaching his disciples about prayer by his own example of prayer. Uh, they were linking the effectiveness of Jesus' ministry uh, with his times of prayer. They noticed when he prayed, things happened. They noticed when he prayed that he would teach with that authority that he knew what he was talking about. And he explained that later by saying, you know, that the Father had disclosed these things to him, you know. And that's why he was able to speak with the authority that he did. And so uh, they were linking effectiveness of ministry with these times of prayer. They clearly noticed something different about how Jesus prayed. His prayers, like I said, were not out of a book. They were personal. They were intimate. Uh, they were centered in a portrayal of a child conversing with his father, you know. The other day, I was so gratified. My youngest son, Jeremy, was visiting with us, and, and he, he said to me, that, Dad, tell me about prayer. How it is that you pray, you know. Uh, explain that to me. Now, he's heard me preach on that and teach on that a number of times, but when he's asking that one-on-one, -on -one, it's different. And I was excited that he was asking me. So I was able to share with him how most of my prayers, I don't even verbalize. I mean, I talk to God in my thought life, you know. Uh, and uh, part of the reason for that is I pray a lot at night, especially in the middle of the night if I wake up. And I don't want to say, oh, almighty God. <laughs> Vicky sits up in bed and goes, what's going on? You know. <laughs> you know? Uh, no, I, I just talk to my father, you know, my, in my heart and in my mind. And uh, so, I don't know if Jesus always verbalized his prayer. And I think when he spent that time with the Father, maybe he just sat there quietly, but there was stuff going on inside of him. As his ministry, as he was praying to the Father. And so, uh, the disciples were wanting to, to kind of get his secret of prayer. Um, in John 14, 10, he said, Do you not believe that I am in the Father, and the Father in me, the words that I speak to you, I do not speak on my own authority. But the Father who, does, who dwells in me does the works. Now, uh, I think he's talking about how he hears from the Father. The Father tells him what he needs to do. He, get, he discloses to him what he needs to be saying at that time. So he listens to the Father. Where? Where is the Father? Where does he hear the Father's voice? In himself. You know, it's a... Uh, uh, he, read, he knows about being the temple of the presence of God, you know. And we pray to the Father in heaven, but you see, when we pray, heaven kind of drops down into our hearts. Uh, and, the, and we are able to commune with God from the inside of our, of our very being. So, uh, so they noticed that the words that Jesus spoke and the works that he did among the people flowed out of this communion in prayer with the Father. What we're being told is that the presence of the Father dwells in him. Uh, and you know, with the coming of the Holy Spirit, what did, what did Jesus say to the disciples in John 14 when he said, uh, that, I'm going to pray that the, that the Father gives you another comforter, the Spirit of truth, who will do what? He will be with you, and he will, what before that though? He will dwell in you. So, if the Spirit is in us, who else is in us? The Father is in us. The Father and the Spirit and the Son are all one. You know, and so, inside of you is the Holy Trinity. <laughs> you know? 
And, you know, it, it gets duplicated, you know, in every believer, you know. So it's kind of a fascinating, wonderful thing. It's something only God can do, you know. Uh, so uh, this is what I think Jesus meant in Matthew 6 when he told the disciples to go into their inner room uh, and, and pray to the Father who is in the secret place. And their Father will hear what you're praying in secret, but he will reward you or answer your prayer openly. You know, so the key there, though, is not the answer to the prayer as much as it is finding that secret place and that inner place of communion with the Father. And that's how we access, you know, uh, you know her secret place is talking to us. I heard her talking to us. So he hears our prayers in that secret place, and it's a place of communion with him. Uh, and you know, sometimes I can go there immediately. And sometimes I don't go there immediately. Something's in the way. Did ever happen to you? Yep. It's like there's a uh, knocking on the door to the secret place and nothing's happening. <laughs> you know? Uh, and I have to ask myself, then, what is it that might be getting in the way of me communion with the Lord? And, uh, uh, and with me, it could be any number of things that I've learned about about myself when that happens. I've been at this for a long time, so I've kind of gotten to know myself pretty well. <laughs> and I know where, where things can, uh, can get muddy, you know, in my soul. Uh, and uh, so then Jesus gives them a simple model of how to pray. And we call this the Lord's Prayer. Uh, we're not going to break down this entire prayer. Uh, but we'll highlight just a couple of things in it. For instance, after he said, uh, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name, your, he said, Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And to me, that is the pivotal part of prayer right there. I don't think we can go any further into communion with God until we understand that we are surrendering ourselves to his kingdom and his will. We're saying, I'm not here to tell you what to do, God. <laughs> you know, I'm not here to explain something to you, Lord. I'm here to listen. I'm here to surrender to your voice and to your will on earth as it is in heaven. I want to know what your mind is about this situation. And uh, I've done this so many times, and, and the Lord has just given me a whisper of a wonderful word. You know, that has helped me with something. Uh, and uh, when I said, Lord, I'm going to just not comment on anything. I'm going to ask you a question about this situation. I've got some opinions. I've got some attitudes about it. But I'm not going to dictate anything to you, Lord. I want to hear what your perspective is. Your kingdom come, your will be done. On earth as it is in heaven. So how can we go on into the prayer unless we are at that point of surrender to him. And so that's a good time to pause. I, I would recommend if you're, if you're using the Lord's Prayer as a model, don't just recite it and get through it quickly. We just say, Our Father, and stop. What does that mean to me? You know, say, Our Father, who art in heaven. Think about it. What does it mean to say, how would it be thy name? Think about it. And you go on, you know, and you begin to uh, do the same thing throughout the prayer. Uh, we will not access the supernatural realm of the Father's secret place without surrender. As uh, we've mentioned to you, the definition of the kingdom of God by E. Stanley Jones uh, it is who he is, what he declares, and what he wills. So if we're not willing to surrender to what he declares, for instance, to his word, if we're saying, well, I don't agree with that, then why are we even talking to God, you know, uh, if we don't agree with what he has to say? Uh, in fact, James, you know, in his first, in his letter, what did he say? If someone prays doubting uh, or being double-minded, it means, he explained it, it means being double-minded, uh, you know, where you've already got your mind made up, then you're not going to hear anything from the Lord. And so, you know, we, we want to not have our minds made up about something when we pray and talk to God. Uh, and uh, 
Then the second thing, uh, entering into the secret place will be impeded if we have unforgiveness in our hearts toward others. We must forgive others just as we desire forgiveness. Uh, and uh, later in Luke 17, Jesus urges his disciples to forgive one another. And it's a, it, it is a briefer version of his answer in Matthew 18 to Peter's question about how many times he needed to forgive a brother who offended him. And what did Jesus say? He said, is it seven times? What did Jesus say? Seventy times seventy. Uh, the rabbis taught three times. How would you like to have that? It'd be pretty cool, wouldn't it? You don't have to forgive somebody three times? <laughs> You're free to hate them? <laughs> you know? Uh, uh, Jesus said, and so Peter's being generous. He's going, maybe seven times will do it, you know? But no, 70 times seven, you know? And how many of you know that, that when a person offends you, it seems like that person keeps coming back, doing it again and again, you know? Uh, and, and, uh, uh, and even sometimes you go to them and, and say, what's going on, brother, or whatever? And, and they say, I don't know, I sure didn't mean to offend you, you know? Then they turn right around a few minutes later and are in some way, you know. And so, uh, uh, and so they don't always get it. And you just pray for them that God opens their eyes to it. Uh, but go ahead and forgive them. Uh, that's an important thing to do. And then when he said that to his disciples, what did they say? Do you remember? Seventy times seven. They in essence were, they in essence said, "I don't think we can do it." You know. <laughs> What did they say? They said, increase our faith. Yeah. Because that's a hard thing to keep forgiving somebody. An offense. You know. And so, uh, here Jesus is saying, he, here's what he said uh, in 17, 6, uh, Luke 17, 6. So the Lord said, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you can say to this mulberry tree, be pulled up by the roots, be planted in the sea, and it will obey you. So, a mustard seed is a very small seed, very tiny seed. So what's he saying here? Uh, it takes only a small amount of faith uh, to grow into the size of a mustard plant, or, 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 or rather a bigger thing uh, that will even be strong enough to pull up that mulberry tree, and, uh, which is a big mulberry tree, they said, has a root system that was just twisted and intertwined together so much that it would take two rabbis 600 years to unravel its roots. Uh, so. Uh, now, if you have a chainsaw, I know it's you know, but you do a lot of collateral damage in the process of that mulberry tree. Uh, the roots of unforgiveness and unresolved anger towards someone are, are much the same way. When somebody hurts us, I see a lot of people dropping out of ministry because somebody hurt their feelings. Have you? Have you seen that? I've seen it many, many times. You know, why aren't you doing this anymore? Well, somebody, somebody offended me. And you know, when you investigate, it was only one person. You know, and you're going, you, you quit serving because one person said something to you that offended you or hurt your feelings? You know? And it's something that people do, you may be aware of this or may not be. When, when we get offended, we tend to, to say, well, the church offended me, you know. The whole church did it. <laughs> no. You know, I see people throwing the whole church under the bus because one or two people messed with them in some way, you know. And uh, we can't have it. We're not going to stay. We're not going to stay. We're not going to continue. We're not going to persevere in ministry if we don't forgive when those things happen. Uh, and uh, uh, I know I would have quit a long time ago, so... Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, you mentioned something about the 70 times 7. Yeah. I thought about that one day. I thought, has the Lord had to forgive me 70 times 7 times in my life? And, and the odds are probably, probably he has. Per day. Probably. probably. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Per hour. Per hour. hour. And, and if the Bible says the same measure by which you measure, you should be measured. Yeah. It would be good <coughs> to forgive 70 times 7. Or whatever's needed for my own skin's sake. It's like that old story about the guy who said, that, you know, that uh, there's this big clock and these hands would go around, and, and uh, the guy asked, said, "Well, what does that mean? Each person has a big clock in heaven, and every time the hand goes around, that's for a sin that's been forgiven." And, uh, and 
they pointed out to Southern Fellow and said, well, I got over there to him, we use his, we use his as a fan. <laughs> <laughs> We forgive as the Lord has forgiven us. That's that's why we pray. So, how effective is our prayer going to be if we're not willing to forgive us that somebody had? Or and uh, uh, so, guys, we just can't be wimpy about this. We just need to do it. Uh, and so, uh, and I'm talking to myself too. Uh, somebody said, should I, you know, uh, should I wait for a person to repent before we forgive? <laughs> Well, no. <laughs> you know, our forgiveness, of, when they repent, we forgive. That's for their benefit. When we forgive before they repent, that's for our benefit. You know, so we don't get stuck with the weight of their debt toward us. You know. Uh, and, uh, and then when they do repent, we're already there. We're already able to say, Brother, I forgave you a long time ago. You know. Uh, and then uh, go on. Now, Interesting that he says, talking about speaking to that mulberry tree. Uh, I, I've got a little insight about that, uh, in that faith gives us, convinces us to speak forgiveness in our hearts. Uh, I told the story to you before about the man that just really abused me horribly uh, when I was involved in this ministry. He was taking money from the ministry and channeling it to his church instead of the ministry I was involved in, where it was designated. And, and I exposed him. I mean, I went for the throat, you know, <laughs> which was not a good thing either. And I was young and dumb, thinking somebody would do something about because he was a power. He was a powerful pastor in that area. He had a lot of political strings attached to him. But in the denomination, uh, he was the godson of the leader of the entire denomination. <laughs> and uh, well, I learned a hard, hard lesson. He went after me like a pack of dogs. You know, uh, and um, and you know, I just uh, I ran <laughs> as fast as I could, you know, rather than get chewed up. Uh, and so, uh, actually, the Lord opened up another door of ministry for me. Just compassionately opened it for me. It was nothing but the act of God. But one day, God spoke to me and said, "Of oh, the Holy Spirit, spoke to me and said." You're really bitter toward this brother. You have not forgiven him. And you're bitter and angry toward him. Because he's tried to ruin your ministry and your name and everything. Uh, and I said, that's right. <laughs> and the Lord just kindly said, if you don't forgive him, you won't have a ministry at all. You know what I did? I spoke those words. There's nobody but me and the Lord in the room. But I said, well, in the name of Jesus Christ, my Lord, I forgive him. And something happened on the inside of me. I still feel it to this day. Just this tremendous load came off of me. And, uh, and it wasn't a few months after that that he died of stomach cancer. Uh, and I don't think God was, I don't think God gave stomach cancer. cancer. He may have given it to himself, you know, but but the point is, I'm glad I forgave him while he was still living, you know. Uh, and, uh, but uh, that's, that's so important in ministry. If we don't forgive people who offend us, it will be hard to, to stay the course in ministry, okay, to continue on. Uh, whether you're teaching a children's <coughs> class, working with a youth group, or visiting people, or ministering, uh, you know, up front in here, or leading worship, or whatever you're doing, you're going to get offended. I guarantee you. But forget when it happens, please. Uh, you know, or you're going to wind up sitting at the end of the bench uh, in terms of serving. Uh, okay. Uh, so, uh, anything else on that? <coughs> All right. Now, verse five of chapter eleven. Uh, this is one of my favorite passages. You've heard me teach from it before. Uh, Luke 11. We're going back to the, just following the Lord's Prayer. Uh, and he said to them, Which of you shall have a friend? And go to him at midnight and say to him, Friend, lend me three loaves, for a friend of mine has come to me on his journey, and I have nothing to set before him. And he will answer from within and say, 
Do not trouble me, the door is now shut, and my children are with me in bed. I cannot arise and give to you. I say to you, though he will not arise and give to him because he is his friend, yet because of his persistence he will arise and give him as many as he needs. Now, um, this is all a big question. The biggest part of this is a question. Jesus had this way of asking a question that demanded a negative answer. Uh, okay? So that's why the disciples, while the best would answer him, it would never happen. You know? Why would it never happen? Because in the Middle East, they were in a village, a typical Middle Eastern village, they were committed to taking care of strangers. Uh, and people who arrived in their midst that needed to be fed and taken care of. Uh, and so this guy shows up at midnight. Is he going to shut, shut him out and say, no, I can't feed you? No, he was bound by honor to take care of that friend who showed up at midnight uh, unexpectedly. Uh, and, uh, uh, and so was the rest of the village. And so in that village, there was one person every day that cooked enough bread, that baked enough bread for an entire week. And he knew who that guy was. <clears throat> So he went and knocked on that guy's door because he was out of rest. Probably his time to bake the next day, you know. <laughs> but the friend showed up at midnight. That, I think there's a little meaning there, don't you? Midnight, you know, just before he's going to go bake his bread the next morning, this guy shows up. Uh, and he goes to the guy who's just baked his bread and said, I've had a friend that showed up at mid you know, here at midnight and I need to feed him. And uh, Jesus said, is, is that guy going to say, well, you've interrupted my sleep, you've wakened the kids and the dogs and <laughs> the livestock and everybody else, you know, and, and uh, go away. No, he's not. Why? Because that man who baked the bread is honor-bound to give that bread. Okay? So here's the interesting thing about it. Uh, uh, it's... it's, it's uh, He goes on and says, is it because the man is his friend that he gives him the bread? No. It's not because he's his buddy. Uh, it's because it's the right thing to do. Uh, and uh, uh, so the question that we come to here is two things, uh, or the key to understanding this parable. One is who, is, who is it that is described as being persistent here? And the second one is, what does the word persistent really mean here? And what I have to tell you is that, uh, and I've done some study and research on this, but there's a great book called Poet and Peasant. Uh, it's about a lot of the parables of Jesus. And this, uh, this guy has done a lot of research, and he, he pointed out how scholars who have studied linguistics of the first century say that that word at that time was translated most of the time as either shamelessness or blamelessness. Uh, are completely honorable. So then if you consider it that way, who would be the person that's being described as persistent? Jesus. It would be the father, the man who's, who had the bread. In other words, because of his blamelessness and his honorableness, he will give him all that he needs. That makes more sense, doesn't it? You know, it is the father, and, th and this man represents the father in heaven. Okay. And so what he's saying here is that when you don't have what you need in ministry to get the job done, go to your father. Knock on his door. Knock, seek, you know, ask. Knock and seek. And he will open that door unto you. And he will give you what you need. But the whole essence of this thing uh, is uh, uh, found in verse, uh, beginning in verse 11. If a son asks for bread from any father among you, will they give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will he give him a shark instead of a fish? Or if he asks for an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? The Holy Spirit is the source of strength, the source of answers, the source of wisdom, guidance. The Holy Spirit teaches us. Uh, the Holy Spirit empowers. The Holy Spirit helps us in our need. And so he's, he's equating here in the parable bread to the Holy Spirit. So when you don't have bread to feed your 
friend who came at midnight or the person who unexpectedly showed up on your doorstep and, need, and needed something, you don't have it, so what do you do? What do you do? Ask the father. <coughs> Knock on the father's door. What's he going to do? Give you what you get. Well, first of all, he's going to open the door. Yeah. <laughs> you know, he's not going to say, don't you know what time it is? <laughs> you know? Throw away. No, he's not going to do that. Because he is blameless and honorable. What you make there to me is the fact that the request is, is on behalf of the system. Is that, the, 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 you're coming to me because you're trying to be somebody else here to me is the fact that and the request is, is on behalf of the system. What that tells me is that, that when I get to you're coming to me because you're trying to be somebody else here to People need counseling. And he's going to tell you that he's talking to his name. And what that tells me is that talk to the Lord and I get the frequent phone and call and try to first year too. People need counseling. Because a friend is asking for help for him to talk through. And the first time I remember was talking to the Lord. That's right. That's right. And I need to ask for that bread. Because that friend is asking for bread for me. And I need to stop. So when you do crisis ministry, that's right. When somebody's in crisis, that's right. I want to say, most people that I've ministered to in crisis, I don't even do crisis ministry. Crisis. When somebody's in crisis. And uh, I want to say, most people that I've ministered to in crisis, I didn't just take a few times trying to give advice and then felt like an idiot afterwards. And, uh, <laughs> you know, because my advice seems so pathetic. But just take a few times trying to give advice and then felt like an idiot. You get these after. calls, you know, I've gotten many calls. You know. <laughs> Because my advice the first and calls I got as a pastor was a girl who didn't make great in college. But get these calls. Right. I've gotten many calls. One of the first calls I got as a pastor was a girl who didn't make great in college. Another one was uh, got this call that one's husband has AIDS. I've gotten many calls about the children of parents. Another one was uh, got this call that one's husband has AIDS and unfaithfulness of the spouse. Many calls about children of parents and Right. The most devastating and hurtful things in the world. Unfaithfulness of a spouse. And, uh, what do you do with that? Somebody wants a divorce and you're not expecting it. Find out you've got cancer. Somebody has cancer. And, uh, somebody I saw somebody wants a divorce and you're not expecting it. Find out you've got cancer. Son. He was still has cancer. Somebody I saw a gentleman not long ago, but many years ago, I like, still a priest funeral of his son. Still in the car right here, right here on one hall five. And my heart still you know, after my son shot himself to death. I mean, what do you do with that? You think you got the answers? You know what to do? After my son shot himself to death. Friend, you're what do you do with that? You think you got the answers? You gotta go to God and ask him what to you know what to do? What? How to minister to that person. Friend, so kind of all, you do, all you need to do is listen. <laughs> you gotta go to God and ask him. I'm going to tell you, a lot of these things, you try to get advice, so you could have all you want. I'm going to tell you, a lot of those things, you try to get advice, so you could have all you want. I'm going to tell you, so call on the Father for this assistance. It could very well be wrong. The Holy Spirit can kind of help these things. I'll see completely what they need to hear. The last lesson Father will review tonight is taken from Luke chapter 15. The Holy Spirit can kind of help In chapter 14, Jesus was telling the disciples how the Lord. invitation to a great feast in the kingdom of God would be rejected in by In chapter 14, Lord. Jesus was telling the disciples the how the invitation to a great feast in the kingdom of God would be rejected by the Lord. I'm going to go to the Bible and have them change out. It's not like they were going to get married. they got to think of their lives. So I've got to go to the Bible and have them change out. I've got to go check around out there. I've got to go to my wife and have them get married. Uh, and give a positive answer. Say, well, you know, I'll probably be able to go. Maybe I'll go. Sure. And then give a positive answer. Say, they, they call and say, no, I can't do it. Yeah. So maybe I'll go. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, sure. Uh, ministry is that way. Right. People, people say, call and say, no, I can't do it. That's our reason. And, uh, 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 the ministry is that way. Speaks. People also guys, what them. Jesus said to them was this. He said, take the message of invitation. Uh, give it to the, the, the highways and byways. Guys, what Jesus said to uh, them was this. The, he said, take the message of invitation. Give it to the broken people of the world. Give it to the, the highways and byways. Uh, where the, the, the crippled and poor and broken that. people of the world are. So here, this is my chapter 15. Uh, you'll find out who he's talking about. 
that all the tax collectors and the sinners drew near to him to hear him. Yes. And the Pharisees 15. and scribes murmured, saying, This man receives sinners. And all the tax collectors and the sinners drew near to him. This man receives sinners. And the Pharisees and scribes murmured, saying, This man receives sinners. He eats with them. This man receives sinners. Tax collectors. What was the reason the sinners and tax collectors Jesus? Because they came around. They wanted to hear him. They wanted to know what he was about. First of all, he was going to be able to ask him to do some Jesus. Because they came around. They wanted to hear him. Then he was not pretentious. First of all, he was going to be able to preach to him about it. He was not threatening. And then he was not going to reach at them. Or they couldn't find any of them. them in some way. Uh, uh, he, he was filled with love and joy. You know, he didn't preach at them. Uh, he was not condemning. He was <laughs> gracious, kind, and in some way. And the uh, biggest he was thing filled is, with he love was and joy. He invited them. Uh, he was not condemning. He was gracious. Yeah, and come on. Him. And the biggest Zach, thing is, I'm going to, what did he tell one tax collector? Zacchaeus. He invited them. Zacchaeus, I'm coming. Yeah, come on. Zach, I'm going to, what did he tell one tax collector? Zacchaeus. I guess I'm coming to your house. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, he described the Pharisees. Here's the deal. We are to emulate Jesus by describing Pharisee people to come to him and be restored. Here's the deal. We are to emulate Jesus by inviting broken people to come to him and be restored. And the tax collectors and sinners have baggage on their souls. And we hold them inside, and their lives were without meaning, and they were overcome with the loneliness. The tax collectors and sinners had bad comes from their self focused lives. And we hold them inside, and their lives were without they meaning, and they were overcome with the loneliness. So love, acceptance, and uh, It comes with the self focused life of using and abusing other people. Uh, and they fellowship with loving God. Love, acceptance. Paul Tortier said, said, We need to see that universal sickness. Uh, that innumerable fellowship and loving God. Laying down their secrets. Laying All down their fears. We need to see that suffering and sorrows. That innumerable throng of men and women. We need to understand how tragically alone they find themselves. They may take part in social sorrows. They may even play a leading role there. We need to understand how tragically alone they find themselves. They may take part in social life. He may even play a leading role there. Sharing club meetings, winning sports championships, having enough confidence in their lives. If God eats away at them, some of them that they may live years. He speaks this parable to them. For him to have enough confidence, none burden himself. What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he loses one of them, does not leave her ninety and nine and verse three in the wilderness and go after the one which is lost? What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he loses one of them, does not leave her ninety and nine and verse three in the wilderness? When he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me. When he is found, if he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. When he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me. Son, I am lost my sheep. Jesus saw those many of them pass the shepherd and bring them home to God. And sinners as lost sheep. This is the heart of Christ for ministry. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> many of you know that Vicky and I recently lost our little dog Tucker. He got out while we were both at work. This is the heart of Christ. And uh, a couple of neighbors. Many of you know Vicky and I recently lost this, but he was all fast. He was afraid that he got out while we were both at work. And uh, so he ran around in the blocks of our house. Rally. Nobody was catching his pass. Everybody else saw him but us. <laughs> I saw him your dog. So he ran around. Three times. Just walking yeah. up. You know, it's from Everybody else saw him but us. I saw him your dog. You know. Three times. You know. It's frustrating. And uh, it was Vicky's favorite dog. I love it. Uh, little Tucker. And I watched her. Those two days he was gone. He was a great person. You know, she was loved that dog. I love him too. Over his dog. But I watched her. Well, I felt come. like I understood a little bit about the shepherd who went after the lost sheep uh -huh. after going around the neighborhoods putting up signs everywhere. And I felt come on, like I understood a little bit about the shepherd who went after the lost sheep after going around the neighborhoods putting up signs. And then one day, on Thursday morning, uh, she gets this call from a, a lady up on the bar here in Hendersonville. And uh, she said, I saw your little dog on Thursday morning. Thursday morning. Uh, she gets this call from a lady up on the bar. Well, what? We'd give 
step back and I saw your little dog in my driveway this morning. Before I came to work that morning, I, I went into the, I went down the bar, up the bar, stepped back for just a moment and I pulled into the bar court. Before I came to work that morning, I and I put a sign down the bar, up the bar. And I pulled, and I pulled off to the side of the road bar here court. in our court, and I prayed, and I said, Lord, and I put a sign on the You know, it seems like such a small thing compared to the big things in this world. And I pulled off to the side of the road there in our court, and I prayed, and I said, Lord, that morning. you know, it seems like such a small thing. And I said, you know, it would just be, it would be so great. But I told him that I'm going to be in she just wept and wept that morning. And she got that call. It would just be, it would be so great. It would help bring her little and I went to the top of the hill. Now, she wound up, wound up walking. She got that car. And we both went up to the barn. And there he was. Uh, and I went to the top of the hill. She wound up, wound up walking. And the Lord brought him back. <laughs> if you look at it that way. He came. He, he, he rested at the very place I had prayed. And the Lord brought him back. Now, that might be look at it that way. He came, he, he was special. So he I, rested. The point I'm yeah. making is that, you know, if we can feel that way about a little dog who is lost, or a sheep who is lost, but the point I'm making is feeling that way about we can feel that way about a little dog who is lost, or a sheep who is just being filled with compassion for lost people. Shouldn't we be feeling that way about people who are broken and needy and struggling with life? Shouldn't our hearts just be filled with compassion for lost people? People uh, out there, and, uh, people who are broken, people who are in jail, struggling with life. Yeah. People, no matter where they are, are people who are just, you know, uh, and uh, you know, people who are in jail. And may our hearts be free. Our hearts are grief for that, that dog. dog. You're just, you know, little dog in need of a savior. But our hearts grieve for lost people. And may our hearts grieve. I think this is our grief for that dog. Get on that same page, our little dog. But our hearts are grieving for the lost people. Great compassion. I think if somehow our oh, rejoicing would be going on around here if they came. And the shepherds would we'll take one last story. When I was uh what rejoicing would be going on around here if they came. We had this week every year. We'll take one last story. It's always a very moving. When I was uh in college. And there were a bunch of us who just really were burning for the war. It was just like my junior year. Always a very moving time. I think my sophomore year. And there were a bunch of us who just really I had not been for the board or my freshman year. Like my junior year. All I did was play around. I think that's been my whatever we thought. I had not been for the board my freshman year. My sophomore year, I got straight to the board play around. And I was so eager to start ministering. We thought. It's gross spiritually and all that. But anyway, my sophomore year, I got straight to the board. I was wearing the chat. And I was so eager to serve the ministry. There was just a great it's gross work for us here at all. Anyways, uh, we all bunch of us were in the chapel. Pray and uh, pray for one another. And there was just a great. I don't know who it was who stood up and said, if there's anybody in your dorm that is away from the Lord, pray for one another. Let's pray and ask the Lord. I don't know who it was who stood up and said, if there's anybody in your dorm. So we began to intercede with the Lord. For those let's pray and ask the Lord to wake them up like we're away from the Lord. And we, we pray for them. So we began to intercede with the Lord for those of our candidates. One by one, we started out like their way to the Lord. This is like two o'clock in the morning. We prayed for them. They started, I kid you not, one by one, one, one started one by one, one started coming into the chapel. And they, this they was like two o'clock in the front and knelt down. They started, I kid you not, they one by one started coming into that I don't know how many there were, but it's a pretty big crowd. They, but they came down to the front and knelt down. And they dedicated their And I'm telling you, if we will get our own army in the word, this pretty big crowd, sensitive for the loss, those who are away from God, uh, and I would know that what we call back. We will get our hearts, people who have never known the sensitive toward the loss, the Lord will those who are away from God. But he will back, gather the call backsliders, or we'll be able to restore restoration. restoration. Uh, the Lord will help to reach out to God, and that's what we have to do. And we'll be able to minister and restore restoration. It's having heart and love and acceptance and forgiveness toward those people. And that's what we need to be sinners uh, uh, at all times. Uh, it's having a heart of love. Uh, there's one little lesson that I learned that night. There's a man I revere greatly, and so uh, Dr. Ward Williams. Uh, there's one of the little lesson that I learned that night. That he was an intellectual guy. There's a man I revere greatly, and Dr. Ward Williams. Anyways, uh, great he, he was with us that whole guy. 
And after we had all been so been praying so much, it was such a high time. He, was, uh, he's, he, was he said, when you have these high times, you know, these emotions. And after we had all been so praying so much, you don't want to ever stop at that point. He said, when you have these high times, you, see, you, said, you, see, you, see, you, see, see, you want to get emotional down with God's word. word. Hey, you don't want to ever go back to your seats and open your Bibles. You want to get fed with God's word. That's the last thing he does. Go back to your seats and open your Bibles. And he gave that statement to me this whole time. It's not about the experiences. That's the last thing we heard that night. Let her catch stones. That statement to me this whole time. It's not about the experiences of his life. It's not that catch stones. It's the ability of foundation. Our soul is God. Because the word of God is life. We'll stop there. Does anybody have any comments or questions? Ability to tell me Anything else? All right. That's the little ministry. Stop there. Anybody have any comments or questions? Here that now to gain confidence. Sheep. Anything else? And looking for the key thing is that you call it my sheep. Even when the sheep got lost in the context of sinners and other people that we're talking about, you immediately led into a parable of responsible sinners. Even when the sheep was lost and lost in the context of sinners and other people that we're talking about, uh, it one, he didn't let in the parable of responsibility. I think that's a good lesson for us. He takes ownership. Uh, we see people who we think will win their lives to win their way to work against, against us. Us. Father does, that they are not our enemy. That's a good lesson for us. We make it strange. But we see people that do make the opposition to and they're our, they're of our family, even though they're not our enemy. enemy. Be very, very strong. We make and that even applies to people in this world. Their kids. Who may be fine, and they're they're of our family, even though that is strange. But our enemies are in heaven, and that even applies to your soul in this world. But we have a strange fight, a mission of reconciliation, and opposition against us. So all our enemies are lost. If Christ is with the spiritual warfare occurs, how could we not? But we have a strange fight and a mission of reconciliation. So all those sheep that are lost, that if Christ is looking for them, then how could we not do this? Well, Dr. Well, you know. Explore these, these, explore the middle of the book of Luke. I've got a lot of fun. I've got a lot of fun. I've got a tree in the ground in the 12. Explore these, these. Training us to explore the middle of the book of Luke. You'll find so many gems. Yeah. Training in the 12. He's training us too. That's why we. Next week, Dr. Wilby, then, our class on ministry of people in crisis. We're going to be talking about that. Our first class will be on the class on the ministry of people in crisis. So, our first class will be on the uh, well, next week, we'll uh, be doing our, 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 our class on ministering people in crisis. So, our first class will be on you know, the what makes of a crisis. What is a crisis? What is a crisis? Uh, uh, how it unfold? How we can help somebody avoid a crisis and become a greater crisis for a long time. Because often that's what happens. You know, how we can help somebody. The person who's been broken by crisis before you know it could be even Because often that's what happens. Uh, when persons are broken by crisis, before you know it, the end of the call for a more and more. And then if you look at John, we'll start. We don't know whichever one is the biggest class there is. We don't hear it. It won't be a class for number four. And then if you look at John, we'll start. We don't know whichever one is the biggest class. I guess we'll be here. And then we'll be here. Every other week. Watch it on TV. Every other week. <laughs> watch, it, watch it on DVD. Right. Or, uh, yeah. Online. Yeah. Yeah. Whatever you want to do. Well, God is gracious, isn't he? All right. Anything yeah. else? Wonderful God. And, uh, I'm thankful that well, God is gracious. I've learned that I'm the fears of God, not my own God. We can trust in him. And uh, hopefully I've learned that I'm trusting. Here's the God, and I'm not the answer to things. <laughs> yeah, Father, well, thank you tonight for and, uh, the opportunity yes. to you know, learn from the yes. lessons that Jesus has taught the disciples. And Father, thank you tonight for. We pray, Lord, that even though Jesus, this is a lot of information, the lessons that Jesus cover a lot of ground to the disciples and to us. We need that you remind us of these lessons. We pray, Lord, that even though this is a lot of information, Cover a lot of ground tonight, just as they were needed to remind us of these lessons. God has sent to our Holy Spirit to unite our community, Lord, with a sense of awareness that they were among the gathered sheep of 
Awesome. Guy that sent to our community, the guitar community board, with they sent some more they are hearts of you deep on your heart. Yeah, we should be passionate. Love and acceptance and repose toward those people. And Lord, may our hearts, Lord, open our opportunities for ministry to call us love and acceptance, even in this, where in our workplaces, wherever we go. Lord, open the opportunities for ministry to all of us. Christ, you must, even in our workplaces, wherever we go. Amen.